Having just recently myself left uh, the Disney ABC culture of strict copyright, which you know they have for Mickey, and intellectual property protection, I'm a little bit unclear about how the future is going to work on something like create, rip, mix, and burn. But Rich Berenick, a professor at Rice University, sees all the possibilities of the next internet revolution. As founder of Connections, he's already breaking boundaries in the new frontier, spreading a new democracy of information flow and education. And he's going to make all of those possibilities crystal clear for us today. Please welcome Professor Rich Berenick. Hello, everybody. Does anybody remember these? Does anybody have any of these? Okay, what, what's happened to these analog LP records? They've been, they've been swept away. They've been swept away by a, an earth-flattening digital revolution that has enabled us to, to do all kinds of new things in, with music and in the music world. And in particular, it, it's allowed anyone in the world, literally anyone in the world today, to be able to create, rip, mix, and burn their own musical ideas. So what do I mean by that? I mean that everyone in this audience, everyone in the world is free to pick up their own musical instrument, express their own musical ideas. Everyone in the world is free to rip or to uh, uh, take musical ideas, re-express them in a new way. Everyone is free to mix together new, old kinds of music to create new kinds of music. And finally, everyone is free to be able to, to put these materials together and to, to burn them onto their iPod or onto their computer, et cetera. And, and I think it's easy to, to see that this, this new digital world touches billions of people every day, and it's created an incredibly vibrant, interactive, innovative community of musicians who are continually working on improving and keeping lively the music world. So I'm not here to talk about music. So I'm here to talk about books, okay? Dead silence, right? Is, is there anything in, in, in relation between the music world and this incredible, vibrant, up-to-date community of musicians and the people that work on textbooks and publish textbooks? I would argue, in fact, that these are worlds apart. And, and I'm here to talk to you today about a movement, the open education movement, and a project called Connections that we started here uh, nine, eight years ago in Rice University in Houston, Texas, that's really intended to pull these ideas from the music world into the educational publishing sphere and allow anyone in the world to create, rip, mix, and burn their own educational ideas. Okay? So that's really what I'm here to talk about. So let's do a thought experiment. So everybody close their eyes. How many people close their eyes? Not that many. So close your eyes and just imagine you could take all the world's books from all the shelves of the educators, all the shelves of the libraries, and imagine you could liberate those materials. And by liberate, I mean in, in two ways. First, what if we could take those materials and tear, literally tear the pages out of the books, right? That would be, you would think that would be chaos, but with today's digital technologies like the web, web 2.0, we can actually organize all of these pages of materials, much like Lego blocks, that can be combined and recombined in new ways to make new textbooks. What if we took those Lego blocks and then we also made them completely free for anyone in the world to use and completely open so that teachers anywhere in the world could readapt these materials for their individual students? And what if we made it really easy to do this and really fast to be able to do this? So that's, that's the thought experiment. So here's a, a global repository of educational materials encoded as Lego blocks. It's a, think of it as a primordial soup. It looks like chaos, but out of this primordial soup of educational materials, we can create very powerful educational machines, right? Machines intended to teach, right? A little bit of algebra here in the right-hand corner, a little bit of geometry up there in the left-hand corner, a little bit of art history in the upper right. Not only that, we can move towards a world, a much-needed world, where we can personalize the material so every kid has their own textbook. Because just like you, every person in this audience has their own particular learning style. And the current method of one-size-fits-all, off-the-rack learning is just extraordinarily inefficient. Not only that, as, as textbook authors and developers, we can get, start to get economy of scale by reusing these Lego blocks in different ways. Once we've written a, a little block on, on macroeconomics, it can be used in myriad different contexts instead of reinventing the wheel hundreds or thousands of times as we develop materials, so making things more efficient. 
The second big part of the thought experiment is imagine if we could invite everyone in the world to participate. Everyone in this audience, all teachers, all faculty members around the world, all parents, and not just in English, but in all the world's languages. And if we could put this all in a globally interconnected repository of materials. So I've given you a, a thought experiment to think about it, but in fact this is here today. And it's known as the Project Connection, cnx.org, and I invite people to, I'll invite people to get involved in it later in the talk. Okay, so you can think of connections then as the, the, the equivalent of the musical world brought to textbooks, allowing anyone, if you will, to become their own educational DJ. So let's go just through a quick tour of open education and connections in particular. Let's look at who's creating, who's ripping, who's mixing, burning. So by create, we mean that anyone can become an author, anyone in the world. So here's a, a standard group of authors. These are uh, university faculty at about 30 universities across the country in engineering. And they basically realized about the same time, about seven, eight years ago, that, that there was no good textbook for their field. And instead of each of them individually rewriting their own textbook, we would pool our efforts together and create one super book, right? Maybe a thousand pages worth of material that then could be mined the 300-page book at Berkeley, the 300-page book at Stanford. Maybe most of these books share a lot of material in common, uh, but, but each of them can be individually customized to the individual classes at these institutions. So this is really the same old people who write textbooks doing things in a much more efficient, up-to-date way. What I'm much more excited about is, is people like Kitty Schmidt-Jones. So Kitty is a, a, a stay-at-home mom and music teacher in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. She is an extraordinary music teacher, and she touches about 25 students every year, right? 25 students work with her every year. And, and what she was looking for was a way to scale up and to reach out to more students around the world. Okay, the, 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 the problem is, is that the way you do that is by writing a textbook. But no one in the textbook publishing industry is interested in a stay-at-home mom and music teacher in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, writing a book. Okay. So she became involved in Connections about four years ago. She put her materials in, and just to give you a sense, she has been used about 7.2 million times over the last number of years. Her material is now used all across the United States in a large number of uh, 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 music contexts in different K-12 through institutions. It's even in the official curriculum in Mongolia. Okay. So global impact from a person who would normally be shut out from the educational materials development process. Here's another example. Sunil Singh is a, is a parent. He's a petrochemical engineer and a dad in Bombay, India. And he was tutoring his kids physics, high school physics. Realized the book they had was terrible. And so he started developing his own materials to help his kids learn physics. Kids around the block wanted the materials. More and more people wanted it. He started to put it into connections. His materials have now been used millions of times. And his materials that were developed in India to tutor his kids are now starting to be used in K-12 scenarios in the United States. Okay, so the idea is that anyone in the world can contribute to this vast knowledge base uh, that, that, that people can use all around the world in different ways. So RIP to us is the ability to be able to create a customized version of a course, right? Translate, customize. So here's an interesting example. These are three graduate students for univer from University of Texas, El Paso. They decided uh, two summers ago that they were going to translate a bunch of this engineering material into Spanish. Within a week of them publishing this material, it was in the top 10 most popular. And we could track the usage all over Latin America and up through the United States. And just to give you a sense, my particular material in Connections is about four times more popular in Spanish than it is in English. Okay, we have translation projects going on in a whole host of different languages. The government of Vietnam has picked up uh, Connections as their educational platform for the entire country. And we even have companies and other institutions that are working on developing translations, not only from English into other languages, but very importantly from other languages into English, so that we can enrich the kind of materials that we're using in our institutions in this country. So mix. Mix to us is the ability to be able to rapidly mix together your own customized course. So Min Do is a, a professor at uh, University of Illinois, and he had to develop a short course. Okay, developing a short course generally means, uh, it was a two-week short course, it means developing a, about a 100 or 200 page uh, set of course notes and course materials. He figured this would take him about three months to write this material from scratch. 
He found out about connections and open access projects by pooling information from these authors here, most of whom don't even know each other. He was able to create his course in three days. Right? So he had about a 30 times speed up in the amount of time that it was going to take him to build his course. And he was able to get on with his other duties in a much more efficient way. Other examples, we have companies like National Instruments, who's based in Austin, Texas, who uh, is a for-profit corporation, but they're actually mixing in their extraordinarily cool and interesting immersive simulation environments, actually creating free plugins so that anyone in the world can access their materials and, and, and interact with mathematics, physics, and, and, and science simulations live on the web. We're also working with a whole bunch of other uh, companies and organizations like the One Laptop Per Child uh, 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 organization to be able to mix together materials that are, are useful to these organizations and companies and also that these companies and organizations want to use as, as outreach. So burn. By burn, I don't mean burn books, right? I mean the ability to... Print your own textbook, right? Make something physical. And I think this is something that's really been missing with web-based uh, educational projects. It's the ability to generate one of these, okay? I'm holding up a paper textbook generated out of connections automatically. Okay, it looks like a regular book, but it actually has all the power of this in new information technology behind it. This book is completely up to date. It's published on demand, which means no version of this book is printed until a person actually presses the button to pay for it. Which means that if the technology in this book changed last night and the material is updated, this book will be updated as of today. Okay, let's just talk about that. There's a recent uh, survey in Texas that showed the, the state's mathematics textbooks that were approved for use in this country had over 300,000 errors in them. Okay, so imagine if when teachers found those errors, instead of change, having the book changed five years from now, it could be changed the next morning. Okay, so change is very, very good in this case. The other a critical thing is low cost. This book would cost about $120 through a regular publisher. Okay, it's about a 300-page book. Through connections, it costs 20 bucks. Okay, so let's talk about cost for a second, which is an extremely... <laughs> an extremely hot button issue in this, in this country. Community college students across the country who have to drop out of community college because their books actually cost more than their tuition, right? Kids in third grade geometry class where there aren't enough textbooks to go around to have one per student, so they have to share textbooks, right? Imagine your kids, one of them's on page 80 of the book and the other's on page 24, Right? How are they going to be able to share this book? This is, a, this is a crisis that not only our country is facing, but a number of countries around the world. And we're just very excited that the, 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 we're able to produce these materials at, at completely free on the web and extremely low cost in print. Okay? So if you just sort of think from a business perspective, what's going on here, this is really going to start, as you would imagine, this factor of five or six decreased in the cost of textbooks is really going to start to put pressure on the educational publishing industry, and I'm going to talk more about this towards the end of the talk, but, but if there's a prediction that comes out of this talk, it's that there's going to be a disintermediation or cutting out of the middleman or Craigslistization of the publishing industry that is not only going to lower costs of materials, but increase the quality of those materials. So really, we're not talking about connections working at the left end of the, the demand curve here. We're really talking about working at the right end of the demand curve here, right? Books on hypergeometric partial differential equations, right? Books that sell 20, 100, thousands of copies a year, right? Which is we're just not efficient for these big publishers to publish. But as people who know about the long tail know, there's tremendous area under this curve, and there's a tremendous number of people that are serving by books under this curve. This has also been useful for a number of, of different organizational publishers, things like educational publishers from university presses to uh, K-12 type presses to be able to get involved in this and use these kind of open education systems to be able to create very low-class textbooks for their school district or for their, their university. Okay, so something that's probably been in everybody's mind, right, is this is all open. Right, we have an open policy that anyone can contribute to this repository. So, so what's going to be in this repository? Right? Think your worst nightmare. Right? So the question then is, how do we balance 
inclusive, open, community-based participation. Really, we have to let anyone participate with quality control because we don't want our kids looking at the good stuff not all of the stuff, right? So what are, how do we do this? And let's just go through a, a horror story that we knew would happen, and it happened very soon after we started Connections. This course appeared, okay, a course on lingerie. Actually, the history of lingerie, it was very interesting for anyone who reads French, okay? The problem with this course is it was plagiarized, okay? This was actually stolen right out of a, a, a French, French feminist journal, okay? which is why it was high quality. And really, the only purpose this course was put up is so that when you click on the course website, you're taken to this guy's lingerie selling website. Right? So how are we going to make sure that kids don't see this stuff, but they find the really useful teaching materials? And really, we're up against a, a, a very difficult problem of balancing the old ways of academics, which is, which is based on peer review. Right? which is very long time scale, review by your peers of the material to find out if it's high quality or not, okay? Which is very exclusive, very slow, very costly, on the one hand. With the other hand, which is community-based participation, which is very inclusive, okay? And this is a very difficult problem. But the, the great thing that's come along in the last couple, couple years is, is, is tools like Web 2.0 and social software. And, and in fact, what we've actually built is a peer review system on top of uh, uh, the, the connections repository that is a, uh, based on Web 2.0 tools like Delicious, Flickr, and, and other tools like that for people who are familiar uh, with them. So let me just walk you through this briefly. The big blue oval is the entire repository. It has really good stuff in it. It has more, and more or less dodgy stuff in it. But when you visit one of these particular web addresses up here, one of these three, you are, you are directed to a very particular spot in the repository. And these are, these are materials in the repository that the, the, the organization that controls this particular lens wants you to focus on. Okay, so if we just think of the analogy of lenses, lenses focus. And so when you go through the IEEE.org slash CNX lens, that will focus on only the material that IEEE has actually looked at and has found to be high quality. Okay, the beautiful thing about this system is it really nicely balances the ability to have a completely open repository with allowing individual organizations that you can trust to be able to control parts of this repository. So hopefully that makes some sense. But this has been a really exciting development over the last number of years. So I'd like to end with just a, some thoughts about where this is all going. Right? Where is open education taking the, the educational publishing world and the publishing world in, in, in general? And I think one thing that, that should be clear is that we're going to be able to move from a world that's very much today's world of, of textbook publishing that is a pipeline. Pipeline model. Authors go in one end, they're ground up, right? And what comes out the other end are textbooks. Okay, and it's a very slow process, years to go from one end to the other. Moving towards an ecosystem world where really we can have feedback, where we have unbundling, right, of the, of the uh, different functions so that one publisher doesn't control vertically all of these functions, but these are controlled by different entities. They might even be different companies. And where we can introduce all kinds of feedback in the process and make these feedback loops go very, very fast. And not only make these feedback loops go fast, but make them keyed on not the bottom line, not profits, but based on actual student learning outcomes so that we can improve the materials continuously and make them as, as useful as possible to people. So you might ask what this is going to do to the economics of the publishing industry. And all you really need to do is look at other similar industries that are already go going through major changes. One of them that I won't talk about at all, but you can imagine, is the software industry and the, the, the dynamics introduced by open source software like Linux, like the Firefox web browser, created a very big stir in, in, in the area of, of software. The, the, the area that I want to go back to is music. Okay? And increasingly, the, mu the music world is undergoing a, just a sea change, okay? moving towards all kinds of different uh, things that we thought were just impossible even a few years ago. Right? Steve Jobs and the, the, the CEO of EMI actually shaking hands and, and providing uh, DRM-free music 
on iTunes that can actually be shared across different uh, uh, appliances in, in, in your house. Moving from, from tightly copyright controlled materials to more openly licensed materials. Organizations like the Creative Commons that are actually allowing authors and musicians to retain copyright of their materials, retain ownership, but then open access to that material for anyone in the world to, to listen to or use. And a growing number of artists are getting involved in this. People like David Byrne, people like the Beastie Boys that are very interested in, in, in really pushing this idea of not remixing educational ideas, but back to remixing musical ideas. And this Creative Commons movement is totally taking hold. There are well over 500 million open licensed educational music video uh, uh, resources out there on the web today. Okay, people have probably heard of the Radiohead experiment. Show of hands, Radiohead. Basically, a band that challenged the value of music by putting their music on the web for free and then letting you decide how much you actually wanted to pay for it. Okay? They ended up netting several million dollars from this, which was more than all of their other digital downloads of all their other albums combined. Okay? So by being open, and then when the album came out on CD, it was number one in the Billboard charts. So by balancing openness with, with, with uh, 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 proprietariness, we can actually do some pretty exciting things. Okay, people have heard of Madonna, who's actually not even working with a record company anymore. That would be like authors not working with publishing companies. She actually signed with her touring company. Okay, so again, the unbundling of the music industry is going to be something that's going to be happening in education. So really, I, I see that the future is going to be a world where authors are going to actually control their materials. Okay, they're going to own the copyright. They're going to open up the licensing to other people around the world. But publishers are really going to become much more like Red Hats. In the, in the Linux open software type of the world. Okay, so I think I will just end there and say that I'll be around all day if people would like to talk more about connections, but I'd like to just end with a, a call to arms and say that everyone here has knowledge to share, and I think everyone here has something to learn, and I'd just really like to, to, to get you involved in connections, uh, sharing your knowledge, getting your kids involved, and I think together we can make the world a better place. So thanks very much.